I remember acutely in 1974 when the hippie movement was like a circus that folded up its tents and left town. And all sorts of people I'd been to rock festivals with turned into me generation and were interested in Beamers and Volvos and other stuff. And I looked around and wondered, what the heck? And it became important to me at that time in my life that it's like all sorts of people went through the wash and came out dirty. And what I do, I call it my calling, is to worry about that problem. That I was nine years a dropout, went back to school, got my doctorate in comparative religion, taught college for a while, uh, five different schools, then ended up retraining as a psychoanalyst. I'm in private practice now. These were day jobs, being a college professor, being a psychoanalyst. What I'm really about is worrying about how when you put people through the wash, they come out clean. And so I'm going to talk a bit about two aspects of that. Um, I want to start by talking about systemic structure. Like, you know, the, the best known social structure that psychedelics have been used in is, of course, the mass religious renewal movement, which is the hippies were an example of. But it's a well-known sociological phenomenon, the Great Awakening of the 1740s for example, led by Jonathan Edwards, um, was the first event in American history where the 13 colonies thought of themselves as a unity. So you were no longer a person from Virginia or a person from Massachusetts, you were an American. And the children of the generation that went through the Great Awakening founded the country because their consciousness had been raised by that renewal movement. Now, a renewal movement like that is a fluke event. Comes along unpredictably through a confluence of factors that nobody can control, and they don't repeat. If you try to create a repeated process, you get stuff like evangelicalism, where people will talk in tongues every week, but it doesn't amount to a mass movement. It amounts to a devotion that certain churches do. People were hoping that the rave movement, this is a dozen years ago, that the rave movement should turn into another hippie movement, didn't happen. Similarly, there is the disappointment now that the ayahuasca movement is not sweeping the country. That's because the nature of a mass religious renewal movement is that they non-repeat. There's a funny story told by, or an interview with John Lennon where, where uh, he was asked, you know, who's going to be the next Beatles? And he said, well, there'll always be a best band, but the Beatles was something else, and the next time it happened, it probably won't even be in music. Harry Potter was another. Where, where something just fired the imagination and leaves people permanently changed in some way. So that's not going to happen, and anybody who's expecting to catch that second time round is really not being realistic. A second social context of psychedelic use is the training of religious specialists. I mean, we have shamans in various cultures, at least some historical European alchemists, use psychedelics and taught their students or disciples their own spiritual paths. There's uh, probable evidence, let's say at this point, that medieval Irish bards, and perhaps Welsh too, were training other bards. But this means a specialized class of people in society training their disciples and their successors. It's a professional thing. Um, so you're talking about a lone teacher teaching a lone student about a very personal kind of psychedelic religiosity, and it can have remarkable longevity because the self-selection of who wants to do that is of a very in rare individual who wants that kind of really solid education and benefits from the one-on-one -on -one educational process. We have texts, you know, fourth century texts from the Corpus Hermeticum, or maybe it's third century, 11th century text from 
the Ismaili called, the, I think it's the master and the disciple, where basically it looks like they were talking all the way, having a conversation on theological topics all the way through the experience and achieving very specific mystical experiences in that process. Now that's one-on-one, -on -one. you can do that. It's a long way from uh, a, a group activity. We also have that kind of thing where I've been talking about, you know, shamans teaching shamans and alchemists teaching alchemists. The kind of thing that you have in the Zoroastrian texts uh, from the ninth century of the common era, not from the ancient Avestan stuff, 800 BC, but rather ninth century after Christ, where it was like an almost lost lore that some handful of Zoroastrian priests still knew how to do the Haoman rite. And so that goes on. I mean, I've argued in my book, Mystery of Manna, for that kind of transmission within the rabbinacy, within the Syriac church. Um, if you go online to my website, I have a bunch of unpublished writings on psychoactives includes a new essay on the medieval church of Rome, uh, 12th through 14th century, secret use of psychedelics, mainstream, not heretical, not marginal, talking about Bernard of Clairvaux, Francis of Assisi, Bonaventure, Aquinas, the biggest names there are. Why the church abandoned it, I don't know. When, I'm not sure. Renaissance, probably, maybe in connection with the Inquisition in Mexico. And they felt that if they were going to shut them down overseas, they were going to shut them down at home too. I don't know. That's an unsolved problem. But anyhow, secret tradition within priesthoods means that the drug experience has to conform with the existing theology. And it's most amazing to me the different varieties of theology that the drug experiences have been wedded to successfully. That means something about drug use we don't know anything about because we talk as if there was a natural propensity of the drug experience. And it's so clear that historically it's more complicated and we don't know how those were used that way. But it looks like Orthodox rabbis stayed Orthodox rabbis and monks, Catholic monks stayed Catholic monks and Hasidim stayed Hasidim and didn't like the mainstream Orthodoxy and so on. Um, Curious, but we don't, you know, that's the state of my research and I don't think anybody else is even worrying about this. Okay, third social context, the religious association. Here is the case where a whole of a tribe, for example, the, the ayahuasca and other using, tr using tribes in Brazil and so forth, where the whole tribe does it together, the whole religion is tailored to the drug experience as that drug experience is done in that tribe, right? So you, here you again you have a possibility of, of a transgenerational transmission, like a longevity to the tradition. And unlike a secret tradition within a larger religion, the religion is restructured to suit. It's a different format. Um, the peyote religions, North America, are another example. Hard to know what to think of, of the ancient Soma rite of the Rig Veda. How much of the population was doing that? Was it just the priests or was it the whole ruling class, for example? We, again, we don't know about the Homa rite in, uh, before Zoroaster. Um, fourth use is the initiatory one, which is the Ibogaine using, given in boys' puberty rights in West Africa. Um, I don't know, I'm prepared always to be enlightened about facts that haven't come my way, whether Ibogaine is used after you're initiated on other occasions. All I know about is that it's part of the puberty ritual. Um, the Bektashi order of Muslim Sufis in Turkey have been documented using a psychoactive drink. It's very little talked about but it appears to be based on Syrian rue and presumably other stuff, which gives you an ayahuasca effect. There is literary evidence suggesting this practice goes back to 
mm, let me think, maybe the ninth century. Um, it's clear that Rumi was doing this, but how much of you ever read about Rumi doing this? So that's the state of scholarship. <laughs> Wasson, Hoffman, and Ruck, of course, argued for the Eleusinian mystery, having administered Urgot as an initiation rite. I picked up their idea and ran with it with the biblical text in my book, Mystery of Manna, um, where I argue that it looks like, if you, we believe the text at Sinai, we had a mass religious renewal. People said, no, 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 that's too much for us. You go do it. So Moses and a handful did it afterwards. And that became the prophetic tradition because the public didn't want to get involved with bad trips, essentially. Uh, so that kind of thing involves a de facto adjunct to a community religion and does not serve as its central element. It's like a spiritual awakening, but then you awaken to the larger religion. You worship Zeus and Apollo and the rest of the gods, and once in your life you went to Eleusis. You participate in a tribal religion, but at your adolescent puberty right, you'd use the drug once. That kind of pattern means you don't get personality change. You get awakening to the possibility of a supernatural world, but you don't get transformed in a, another way, except by fluke. You know, there's once, one rare person needs one hit and their changed personality. Mostly one hit means, oh my God, there is a God. And that's it. Um, there's a fifth sociological model, and that's the one that was invented in the West almost by accident, which is the therapy model, where you have a trained professional who works with a layperson, an untrained person, and tries to take that person through personality change. There were two basic models, as I'm sure most of you know, in the 50s and 60s. One using low doses and talk therapy, and the other high doses and no talk. Essentially, the blindfolds and, and headphones, and that's the only stuff the DEA has allowed to be tested since about 65. Talk therapy was not going to let you talk to a person who's high. No, no, no. Um, so these are both working with medical models. I would like to emphasize that I'm fully in favor of the medical model, and I have myself trained as a psychoanalyst. Um, by the way, I have a small piece on my website about Freud's mushroom hunting, which is a well-documented but little spoken of fact. He, we have him going for mushrooms every August, September from, nine, from 1874 into well into the end of the 1920s, maybe the 30s. It was a family tradition. He took his kids and his grandkids, and they kept it quiet because people would disapprove. Which mushrooms? Well, his son said he used to spot Amanita, but he, was, he liked the small brown one that was found next door to it. Uh, Freud. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I, I drift. I always drift. So, so the whole notion of a therapeutic model I'm in favor of, but it's not what I'm really about. What I'm really about is the idea that we need to invent a new profession which is going to do spiritual direction. I mean, psychedelics is the one spiritual path in all of known human history that proceeds without spiritual directors. I mean, do it yourself, my God. What, what lack of any kind of history produces that? Why do we not have an accumulated body of lore that is transmitted? Why is it reinvented every day? And how do you get respectable if you do maintain it at that level of naive amateurism all the time? Yeah? But then my own path is so Bible-oriented anyway, what do you expect from me? So I mean, you can disqualify me from that standpoint, and that's fine. But if you're into this other point of view, let me give you some ideas about what I'm thinking of. Um, to begin with, I'm only going to talk about LSD-type drugs, which I define as drugs capable of 
what are called pseudo hallucinations, a hallucination that you know is a hallucination while you're having it. As distinct from a true hallucination where you really think what you're seeing is real. So if you know it's in here rather than out there, it's a pseudo hallucinogen. And I'm told that all pseudo hallucinogens, if you boost the dose, become truly hallucinogenic. The thing about hallucinogens versus pseudo hallucinogens is the window when you have that threshold state. That some have such a small window that the moment you're high, you're already hallucinating. Others, you get high and for a, a range of doses that can be predictably, predictably accessed, reliably accessed, you can hit the pseudo hallucinatory dosage level. Now for me, that's a remarkable state. That's really what my book um, the ecstatic imagination is about because I believe it's a non-specific enhancer of imagination of which an important part is reflective awareness the ability to know that you are watching your mind while you watch your mind it is reflective awareness is what Buddhist mindfulness is about but rather than mindfulness and detaching from your contents it's mindfulness and work with selected contents. It's an awful lot of Christian and Jewish meditation that is mindful to specific contents, as distinct from empty mind or detached mindful. Um, they're not part of the mystical tradition in Christianity. They're called meditative and devotional, and you won't find that literature on shelves about mysticism. You have to look at devotional literature to find that stuff so that they're separate people who even study these things. But at any rate, reflective awareness is a kind of psychological mindedness. And one of the things that that arises at, or gets you to is the notion that mental images are mental images. Now there's two directions you can go. The traditional way in say Jewish and Christian thinking is that once you know that the mental image is a mental image you avoid idolatry because you recognize it as only an image and you aspire to the concept of a more spiritual God who can't be imaged. The other way one can go with that material which is where I see the harmonization with psychotherapy is that you then can ask, well, where the heck did I come up with that particular image versus another particular image? And then you're into Freud's ballgame. And you can do both. You can both deconstruct your own tendencies to idolatry and pursue the theology and do therapy on the idolatry inclinations. And by the way, Jesuits have worked that out. They're already doing that. That's where I picked this idea up from. Um, they say basically that anything that's an obstacle between you and God has got to be recognized as an obstacle and find some way to, to get rid of those inhibitions. Then, okay, self-observation can lead you to another kind of behavior. This is Dante's portrait in hell where I got the idea. Um, a liar goes through life expecting to be lied to, afraid of being lied to. A thief goes through life expecting to be so stolen from, fearing always. So that Dante basically portrays the seven deadly sins as seven kinds of hell because of our own projective systems. What you're guilty of, you fear, being on the receiving end of. And in fact, we self-sabotage afterwards, right? This unconscious guilt gets us to self-sabotage on top of that. So all of this is a kind of moral self-education that is routinely done in certain schools of psychotherapy. I mean, and is totally conducive with the self-observation process. But it produces a moral transformation. And one of the Freudian schools, the, the British Middle School it's called, works on that consistently as one of the things you do with people. You get people to the point where they recognize they're destroying themselves by creating their own fear cycle. And what they're really doing is they're committing crimes against others that were committed against them as children. It was good enough for me, I'll dish it out to you, is the logic. And when love wins out over aggression, 
there is repentance. That's the process. That's the moral transformation. So that now, the love comes up. It seems to me in the unit of experiences. I mean, we we are a symbol-forming creature in our minds, and in our minds, any one thing can represent any other thing, including all things. So that one, th you know, all eternity in a rose, or in a grain of sand, or a drop of water, right? That's the function of the symbol forming function. It's got nothing to do with supernatural. It's got to do with mental processing of ideas. And it's inevitable, I think, if you let imagination go far enough, which is to say you boost it with psychedelics, that you start having unitive experiences. Now, interpersonally, that becomes, I hurt you when I hurt me. I hurt me when I hurt you and vice versa, yeah? I got it backwards, but it works both ways. Because an eye for an eye and love thy fellow as thyself are the same emotional truth. Just one is meaner than the other. But they're the same sense of reciprocity, of ultimate equivalence. So if you use unitive experiences to promote empathy, altruism, identity with others, love for others, you then have the love that you need to rein in aggression and produce moral transformation. Yeah? How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, I want to give you another basic concept. There are such things that Aristotle called abstract objects. The Middle Ages talked about uh, the best word I know is intelligible. So there's things you can see and things you can't see that are quite real. Like every law of nature you ever heard of, you cannot see. Because a law of nature expresses a relationship. You can see, you know, one mass and another mass and they attract at a certain rate. But the process of attraction is invisible. The relationship, the mathematically expressed relationship, is not perceptible. It's thinkable, but it's not perceptible. Now, the, the realm of the thinkable has been neglected in modern psychology because the word cognition and cognitive thinking covers perceptibles, imaginables, and intelligibles. So mental images is a cognition. A sense perception is a cognition, and an idea is a cognition. And as a result, we don't separate them out in our current psychology, and that's to our loss. Because the Middle Ages called intelligibles spiritual. That's in, in German, the language, the, the word Geist still means both spirit and intellect. Because all spiritual realities, think of, of basic things like honor, trust, faith. We're talking about invisible relationships among, between different actions. Think of revenge. What is the principle of causality in revenge? Somebody does something, somebody else does something else, there's a relationship. We have an idea of it, we have different emotions about it, right? The a whole lot of, of psychotherapy is taking neurotic emotions towards relationships of this kind and replacing them so that instead of thinking revenge is a dumb idea, you think it's a great idea. Right? There, there was one paper I read by an analyst in 1935. He talked about emotional syllogisms. Uh, the best, the, the funniest one I know is a Madison Avenue joke from the 50s. I don't know why he hates me. I never did him a favor. There's people like that. They cannot tolerate gratitude. If you make them feel gratitude, they hate you. And therapy is about changing those invisible relationships, those links. Five minutes, no problem. So, intelligibles is a big piece of what unitive thinking is about. What's mysticism? It's the, the awareness of the unitive nature of reality. Yeah? And for me, that's consciousness expansion. For me, what is in fact happening is an expansion of the quantity and variety and sophistication of the intelligibles with which you think. I mean, children below the age of puberty don't have many abstractions. They work much more concretely. And 
the acquisition of higher order abstractions gives you freedom from your own emotionality. They allow you to find your center, your balance, your poise, whatever you want to call it, and to make choices. Instead of feeling compelled by your emotions, you get to choose among them and fix the ones that are disordered, which allows for a higher order of morality, yeah? Now, I would like to suggest that the phenomenon that Jung called synchronicity is a perception of relationships. It's a perception of intelligibility that's out there in the world, not just in your head. Because the event really happens synchronously. It's not just love, honor, and things that are human projections. It's happening. What a coincidence. Now, with coincidences, you have two options. One is to say, oh, it's striking, but it's random. Or the other is, it's striking and it's non-random. It was intended. The intended option means you have to imagine a personal deity doing the intending, which gets me back to the biblical text. Um, the point I want to make is whichever route you go, Synchronicity is about the perception of opportunity. Something happens in the world and you have a choice to make. How are you going to handle it? Because a synchronous event confronts you with an opportunity. It's, a, it's like um, possibly a lesson, possibly a suggestion, however you want to take it. And there is always a time to choose between good and evil, or good and better, depending. And that's what it's really about, doing the Lord's work, ultimately, seems to me. So anyhow, that's the kind of program, wedding, spiritual direction, and psychoanalysis, that I imagine as the territory to be worked that covers the varieties of psychedelic phenomena. And within reasonable limits, non-denominationally. Or that is, it, I'm aspiring towards something that would stand a chance of being called a natural, spontaneous, inborn proclivity towards spirituality that is not overly loaded dogmatically. And that's my talk. 